hello and welcome church. We're so glad that you're here. Come on, let's stand to our feet and worship our God who is worthy of all the praise. Amen.
be the same. We'll never be the same. We go from glory to glory to glory. We're forever changed. Forever changed. You call me your
darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have it in the goodness of God This week, um, actually just yesterday, my wife and I were looking at some old pictures. You ever done that before, taking out? It's kind of hard to do that nowadays because they're generally on your phone. It's kind of hard to find them. We had a box of old pictures that she was rummaging through because we were thinking about this coming summer, our 35th anniversary as a church, and just looking at some of those old pictures. And I looked back and I thought, my goodness, did I ever really look that way? You ever have those moments? As we were looking through those pictures, we were just reminded of just all through the years, this is our 35th year here as a church, and you go back over the history of those things, you realize that, that God has been faithful over time, and it's just not our lives, it's your life too, and that's what I want to tell you, that as you look back, you can say, God, whatever I've gone through, and the ups and downs, the trials, the tribulations, the moments that have been difficult, the moments that have been joyous, all my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been good. Can you just take a moment, lift your hands tonight, just tell him, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you get me through. Lord, tonight we come before you with hands lifted before you just to tell you that we love you. 
We thank you so much that you're a faithful God, that even when we're not faithful, even when our faith fails us at times, you're still there for us. You're holding us up. You're carrying us through. We want to just take a moment this evening, Lord, whether it be here on site or online, and just to lift our hands and lift our voices and lift our hearts before you and tell you, God, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your greatness. Thank you for your consistency in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you never fail us. Thank you, Lord, through all those trials we've walked through over the years, all those challenging moments you've gotten us through, all the prayers you've answered, Lord, all the times that you haven't answered a prayer because you knew the prayer we prayed was not for our good. Lord, we thank you for the yeses. We thank you for the no's that you've given us. We thank you for the wait time that you've given us. Lord, we thank you that you've just been good to us in every realm of life. We honor you, we worship you, and we thank you for all that you are to us. In Jesus' name, and all the church together said, Amen. Amen. All the people online and on site said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome to church tonight. So glad that you're here in worship. And just so good to have you with us on this weekend. If you're with us for the very first time, we're especially glad to have you with us. Whether you're watching online or here on site, we'd like to just say, hey, thank you for being a part of our service this weekend. Let me encourage you to do something. If this is your first time, here's what we want you to do. Uh, grab your phone and download our church app. That's the easiest way during this season to connect with us and stay connected, whether it be through just information or through giving or whatever you'd like to do. The church app is the real central part that's key for you. All you need to do is take your phone, download the MyCOR app. It's on the Apple Store. It's also on the Google Play Store. And then there's, if you're new, there's a place there for you to let us know about uh, you, you being with us this weekend, and we can find out a little bit more about you and how we can connect with you and, and make your life uh, uh, information about church and how you can connect your life here with the life of Church of the Redeemer. A lot of great things happening in our church. We're very excited about it. And I tell you, one of the things that we are very excited about this weekend is this Mother's Day. And I think we ought to give a good round of applause to all of our moms. We love you. And for joining us online as well, all the moms that are joining us online as well. We're just so very grateful for each one of you and for the sacrifices that you make for us, the love that you show to us. And we want to take just a moment, there's a little video that we want to share with you that'll just give you a little bit of a reminder of how much we love you. So, so, so take a look at the screens before we go into tonight's message. Church of Redeem, my family, I'm just here celebrating Mother's Day. Um, I love my mom. Um, she taught me a a lot of things, but the main thing she taught me was to to be self-sufficient. I love my mom because she gives me the best hugs. Because she's always supportive of me. And she cares about me. I love my mom because she always has encouraged me. Because she introduced me to God and she's the reason why I'm here right now. She helps me. She does what we care about her. Because she's full of wisdom and she passes that on to me. Because I like her giving me hugs bestest mom in the world because she always cooked me for for breakfast and lunch. I love my mom because of how compassionate she is towards me. Because she shows me unconditional love. Because she's the most patient and caring person that I know. I love my mom because of the legacy she has left for me and the example of how to be a great mom. Feliz Día de las Madres, Mami. Te amamos. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's, Happy Mother's Day. Day! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day, moms. Fantastic. We love you. I hope you have a great day tomorrow. Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for your word this evening. So grateful that we can come and gather around the word of God. And we ask in these next few moments you'd speak to us. Let something come to our hearts today that will help us to move forward in our relationship with you. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you probably know, if you've been around for the last several weeks, we're involved in a series of messages on relationships. We're going to continue in that series this weekend and into the days to come. Uh, actually, up into the first part of June, we'll be looking at this very important series because I would say this last year has been a year that has tested and challenges, if anything, challenged, if anything else, our relationships. The distance that we've had from people and then uh, sometimes the uh, the closeness we've had with a certain number of people has challenged us in a variety of ways in terms of relationship life. And the Bible has a lot to say to us about our relationships, about our friendships. I want to talk to us this weekend about the same theme that we talked about last weekend, growing in grace in the relationships of our life. 
it's extremely important the kind of person that you are, the kind of person that you're becoming in life, because who you are is going to attract other people like you. It's the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And it's extremely true because whoever you are in your character, your nature, your interest, uh, who you are in terms of values and beliefs, you're going to attract people like that. As has often been said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, how true that is in our relationships. And it all starts with you. And it starts with you being intentional about choosing the right people in your life, not just passively letting people come into your life, but having some good boundaries. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Not that you separate people out in the sense of uh, being rejecting to people, but when it comes to the people that you're closest to, there's some intentionality uh, to choosing the right people for your life. As I said, we're going to talk tonight about this idea of graciousness in relationships. And this whole idea of graciousness in relationships doesn't start with us. It actually starts with God. And as we looked at last week in the, in, the, in the book of Psalms chapter 116, the Bible says the Lord is, what is He? He is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. And so we are to be righteous, because, excuse me, gracious because God is. What is He? He is gracious. We're going to see some examples of that as we go through this evening together. The Lord is gracious and righteous and full of compassion. Now, each one of us, now that we know who God is and we have a relationship with Him through Christ, we must understand that we have a responsibility, that God is gracious. We come into relationship with Him, and now we have a responsibility, as we talked about last weekend, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So I want to really emphasize again, as we're uh, taking off in this, this time this evening, that we are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Growing in grace is something that we need to do, and it's not just growing in grace in the sense of your relationship with God. That's extremely important that we get to know Him better and we let His grace affect our lives, but His grace should not stop just with us, but it should flow through us to the people around us. There's a horizontal dimension to growing in grace, that you and I need to become more gracious in our relationships with people. Have you ever met a really gracious person or had a really gracious person come into your life? And you know what a beautiful thing that is just to have someone that steps into your world in a needed time and it seems as though they just walk in with bucket loads of grace and it just makes a huge difference in processing life, walking through difficulties and just having the right kind of friends around you. And my prayer uh, for myself and my prayer for all of us is that we would learn to grow in the grace of Jesus, not just vertically, but also horizontally. Now, I want to take you to a story in the Bible tonight that gives us an illustration of, of this idea of graciousness, and it's taken from the life of a, of a man by the name of David. You know him well. He wrote many of the Psalms in the Bible. And so if you have your Bibles, you might want to take a look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, actually 13 verses. So there'll be a number of verses that tells a great story for us about David's graciousness to someone. And then from that, we're going to extract some principles for our lives tonight. So let's dive in together. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1. It's a story of David and a man by the name of Mephibosheth. David, this is uh, uh, many years after uh, his, he becomes king of Israel. David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show? What is the word here? Kindness. kindness. The actual Hebrew word is hesed there, and it's, it really is very close to the concept of grace. Kindness, grace, compassion, all those terms kind of overlap one another. So David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? Now, don't pass by that very quickly because who was Saul? Saul was David's arch enemy. Saul was the man that was trying to kill David for a number of years. And so he's now asking the question, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I cannot destroy, to whom I cannot find an opportunity to make miserable? No, he says, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show, what's the word again? Kindness, or we'll use the word grace because it's, uh, the actual Hebrew word literally means favor there. I can show kindness or favor or grace for Jonathan's sake. Jonathan was Saul's son and had been a great friend of David. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. 
They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba at your service? He replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Maker, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, here's the key. Now, first time in this passage, we're getting the name of the person. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. I want to stop there for a moment and give you a little bit of history before we go further. So it's David asking for someone from the house of Saul that he can show kindness, grace, favor to for the sake of his, his former friend who has now passed on Jonathan. And the servant comes as he's been requested by the king to come. And he says, yeah, there is one guy that's left. One of the sons of, 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 of Jonathan is left. He's lame in both feet and, it, feet, and his name is Mephibosheth. Stop there for everybody. Say Mephibosheth with me, okay? Really extra hard to say with your mask on, isn't it? Okay, Mephibosheth. Well, why was he lame in both feet, and what's this story all about? Well, if you go back earlier in Second Samuel, we'll find out that Mephibosheth, at the time that Saul was killed in battle and Jonathan was killed in battle. Uh, they come and they tell, the, there's a little boy by the name of Mephibosheth. Actually, he had a, a different name at the time, uh, from what we can tell in Scripture. And they come back to his nurse who's taking care of him, and they tell him that, that both his grandfather and father have been killed in battle. And of course, at that time, Saul was the king, and so the, 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 the fear was that now the one that had killed Saul and Jonathan, the prince, in battle most likely was coming for all the king's heirs and would kill them as well. And so uh, they, the nurse that's taking care of little Mephibosheth, he's five years old at the time, she becomes very afraid. She grabs him up to run and take him out of the the house to a place of safety, and she drops him. Must have been a significant drop because evidently he became, he became lame in both of his feet. And from that day forward, from what we can get in Scripture, there's some sort of fill-ins that you have to kind of put pieces together, but it seems it was at that time or near that time that he was given the name Mephibosheth, which means this, shameful thing. That's what the name means. You're, you're a person of shame. You bring shame to the family. And now he has no ability to walk. He's lame in both feet. And he's been living away in a place called Lodabar. And the word Lodabar actually is it's very interesting. Sometimes in the Bible it's quite interesting to see the names of places and how they connect with the story. And that's what's going on here. Lodabar actually means a place where there is no pasture land. So it's a place of depression. And actually it's very close to the name itself, Lodabar. Lo, it's a low place. It's a place where... Nothing good's going on. And so he's way out there on his own. He has to be taken care of every day. He's lame in both feet. He feels like his life is a mess. Everybody calls him a shameful thing. And he's living in low debar. He's the picture of someone that's one of the lowest places of life. A place of shame. A place of his own self-hatred. Self-disgust. Self-misery. Looking at his life and seeing no future at all. And here's the king, King David, saying, Is there anyone, anyone from the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for the sake of my friend Jonathan? And the name Mephibosheth comes up. He calls Mephibosheth in. Can you imagine being called to the house of the king, to the palace of the king? He has no idea what's going on. He's perhaps thinking that, well, he finally found me, and he knows that I'm the grandson of Saul, and it seems like my life now likely will be over because uh, Saul and David were enemies, and so maybe it's my time to be killed. Maybe this is what's going on. I've been found. Notice what happens next. Don't be what? Don't be afraid, David said to him. That, that implies that he was afraid, right? Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you favor, kindness, grace for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will, oh my goodness, restore to you 
All the land, notice that, all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you you should notice a dead dog like me? See his perception of himself? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Wow. Isn't this a good story? Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah or Micah, and all the members of Ziba's family, Ziba's household, were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. David just gave us one of the most beautiful pictures of being a gracious person. This is, this is what gracious people do. Instead of extracting revenge on the family of someone that had been an enemy for a long time, he says, I've got to find something good to do. I've got to find a blessing to impart. I need to show some grace to Saul's family because I had a friendship with Jonathan and I promised that I would always take care of his family. And there in that moment, he said, I've got to find someone to show this kind of grace to. It's actually, a, this is another story, another message for another time, but it's actually a beautiful picture of Jesus and what he does for us. Because when we come to Jesus, we're, most of us are, actually all of us will acknowledge where we are in life. We're living in a low to bar of life. We're living in a place of sin and brokenness and shame and lameness in our life. And, and then Jesus calls us and he says, I want you to come and sit at my table and I want you to come and I'm going to restore to you those things that have been lost from your life. I'm going to bring you into my, my family. You'll always eat at my table from this time forward and for now into eternity. And there's the blessing of grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Is there anybody glad that Jesus found you as a Mephibosheth and brought you to his table? Aren't you glad about that? Wonderful thing. Okay? This is beauty. This is grace. But that's not my purpose tonight to talk about the beautiful aspect of what Jesus has done. I certainly want to emphasize that and make sure we're aware of it. But I want to bring it to this, this human side for a moment. This is, the kind of, this is the kind of person that he wants us to be. He wants us to be like him. We're to be as he is, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I laid out for you last weekend eight uh, principles or eight uh, characteristics of, of a gracious person, and I told you there were 16 of them, and so we're going to finish the, the, the next eight today. And what I hope you'll see as I go through these eight fairly quickly is I hope you'll see them written into the story, woven into the story of Mephibosheth, but also I'll give you some other illustrations as we go through. So let's get ready to focus on eight characteristics of being this kind of person. What does a gracious person look like? Number one tonight, they are compassionate to others. Gracious people know how to show compassion to other people. And the word compassion is a word that's really important to understand. It means that you have a sympathetic consciousness of the distress of other people. That you kind of, it's, it goes very much along with the idea of empathy, that compassion and empathy means that you are, you're able to feel what other people feel and it, it touches you in the core of your being to the degree that you're now wanting to take action. See, compassion really isn't compassion if it's just a feeling, but real compassion always moves you to action. You'll find in the gospel accounts many times Jesus ministering to people and it says he was moved with compassion. He did something because there was something that stirred inside of him when he saw need in another person's life. 
It's interesting that you'll find this idea of compassion in the book of Exodus when the story, you might recall the story of Moses because all the little boys were being killed and so Moses' mom decided to put him in a little little basket and hide him in the Nile River and and then the the daughter of the Pharaoh comes along and finds this little boy in the the river and she draws him out. Why? Because the Bible says she was moved with compassion. See, compassion saved Moses' life. It brought him out and gave him a future. And how many people's lives can be given a future just because you can take and I can take an act and demonstrate an act of compassion to others? And so to be able to be compassionate to others, you have to get outside of your world at times and your pain at times and what you're going through at times and the issues of your life and be able to make room in your life to feel for the pain and the needs of other people. That's what grace does. Gracious people make room for other people for the opportunity of compassion. The next one, these are fairly simple, but they're important to remember. They're also kind to other people. The word kind I'll give you some other words for a kind here. It's helpful. Uh, You're able to actually extend help, as we kind of talked about related to, 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 to compassion. But here's another word that might add a little bit more to that. It's it's gentle. That's oftentimes used as a synonym for kindness, gentleness. One of the Greek words that's used for gentleness or kindness in the Bible, that concept of gentleness and kindness is a word that describes a horse. It's a meek horse and a horse that's actually been domesticated. It has strength and it has power, but it doesn't destroy with strength or power. It has the ability to be kind, rideable, if you will, capable of being used. There's a gentleness to it. If you've ever done any horseback riding, you can appreciate a gentle horse. You can appreciate a horse that will treat you kindly. And the same is true for you and me. You can have compassion. I've known people that were very compassionate people, but they weren't very gentle. Okay. And you can be compassionate without gentleness. And so gracious people not only have the compassionate nature, but they also have a gentle approach, a soft touch when it comes to other people and how they're working with them and dealing with them and even helping them in their life. Here's our third thing. We're going through eight of these tonight. They are generous in all their dealings. Let's go back to the story of Mephibosheth for a moment. When David called him into the household and he met him for the first time, Mephibosheth was afraid. And the first thing David says is, don't be afraid, which actually is very empathetic. He identified with what Mephibosheth was feeling, was very compassionate. He was very kind. But also he says, here's what I'm going to do. Don't be afraid Mephibosheth, because what I'm going to do to you, he could have very easily given him, given him just a, a little gift and said, hey, it's nice to meet you. I hope this will be a blessing to you and send him off. But no, there's a generosity in the graciousness. He says, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to restore to you all that you, all the land your daddy had, your granddaddy had, I should say. Can you imagine? How much land do you think Saul had? He had a lot. He was king, okay? He had a lot of land. He said, I'm going to restore to you all that land and And by the way, we're going to get somebody else to farm it for you because we know you can't farm it. And so that's generosity. And and, and let's add to that, we're going to be at my table every day. And when all the, all the, my family comes around, you're part of the family now. And so you just come in and sit at my table. Don't feel ashamed of being a part of the family. You're now in my family as well. I would say that David was demonstrating great generosity. Would you agree with me? And dear ones, I think one of the things that will help us in our lives is to get past stinginess and giving. I'm not just talking about finances here. That's, that's one other, that's another message for another time. I think it applies to that as well. But so many times we live from the standpoint of scarcity. If I, if I give of my time or if I give of my energy or if I even give of my finances or whatever it might be, that there's not going to be enough for me. But, but David had this mindset of saying, no, it's, it's really not about holding on. It's about pouring out. And one of the things that I am learning and have learned over the years, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a statement perhaps you've heard before, but it's so very true. You cannot outgive God. You can't outgive him. Because when you give to God and give to other people in his name, there's something of a reciprocity that flows back. I'm not talking about some kind of weird, strange prosperity theology. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that God, I believe this principle to be true, that if God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Okay. 
but he wants to get it through you. We're blessed to be a blessing. And so David understood this. He was gracious. He was generous in his dealings. Let's go to the fourth thing together. Gracious. Grow in grace. They diligently guard against prejudice and judgment toward others. They, they diligently guard against prejudice. What is prejudice? Prejudice, let's just break it apart and say what it is. Prejudice is prejudging someone on the basis of anything. It's prejudging someone on the basis of social status. It's prejudging someone on the basis of the color of their skin. It's prejudging someone on the basis of where they live, the car they drive, the clothes they wear. It's prejudging anyone on the basis of uh, what political party they're in. It's prejudging anyone on the basis of any of those kind of things. It's prejudging. It's putting someone in a category in your mind and then relating to them out of that without really knowing them. That's what prejudice, prejudging, that's all prejudice is. And prejudice is unfair to people because you don't know people. And you don't want people judging you before they know you. And so gracious people make the decision of saying, I'm not prejudging anyone. I'm going to diligently guard against prejudice and judgment in my life toward others. There's a story in the Bible, and I've referenced it a few times recently, but I want to bring you back to it. Jesus told the story of the, uh, the Pharisee, the self-righteous Pharisee, and the public and the tax collector who went to the temple to pray. And the, 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 the Pharisee prays first, and he says, oh, I, God, I thank you that I'm not like that guy over there. He didn't even know that guy over there other than what he labeled him to be. And he says, you know, I do all these different things and keep all these commandments, and aren't you really blessed to have me, God, in your, in, in your world, God? And, and then the, 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 the tax collector just bowed his head and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Bible says it was the man that was humble and the man that had a proper spirit of humility and and, and grace toward God that went away justified and had his prayers heard. Why? Because the Pharisee was living in judgment. He was living in an attitude of prejudice and judgment toward others. He didn't know the man's heart. So gracious people are diligently guarding. You know that you have to diligently guard yourself? from these kind of things. And Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to diligently guard ourselves against these kind of things getting inside of us. And by the way, there's a lot of this stuff in the world today. Amen? Okay? There's a lot of this stuff in the world that should not be in us as believers. We should work diligently to guard against it. Number five, this is what grace is, okay? Grace does not come to a person with prejudice or judgment. Here's our next one. They're easily entreated. What does it mean to be entreated? That as they respond easily to, uh, to opportunities or to request. I'm going to tell you a quick story from the Bible tonight. You might not know this story. You may know it. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And I'll try to tell it to you as quickly as I can because it's really a story about one guy that's not very easily entreated and, and one guy that is. And that guy happens to be David again. David's coming up a lot tonight. And 1 Samuel 25 is a story of a man by the name of Nabal. His name means fool. And his wife, Abigail. And the Bible says that David had been out. He was, it was during the time of battles that David was going through. He had a bunch of men with him that he had to feed. And so uh, what had happened was he was at a place that he needed some food. And Nabal had a big farm, a lot of livestock, a lot of good. I mean, he was a very wealthy guy. And so David goes to Nabal or sends a messenger to Nabal who owns this farm. And David says, Nabal, we, we need some help with our guys. And by the way, just so you know, we've been guarding your shepherds out here for you, and we've not let anything happen to them. We've been good to them, and we've been taking care of your people out here. Could you give us a little bit of something? We need some food. Could you help us out a little bit? Everybody following the story so far? Okay. Nabal's, so it was an entreaty, okay? Would you do this for me? Would you help me in some way? Here is a request. I am in need. Is there something you could do for me, for us? And David really was not asking for himself. He was asking for his men. He's making an entreaty to Nabal. And Nabal responds, no, I'm not doing anything for you. I'm not going to do anything for you. You don't, you're not going to get any of my food. Turns him away. You can read. This is a complete paraphrase, but it's, a, it's that you'll read the story in 1 Samuel 25. David is very upset by that. And he says, we're going to go after that guy. We're going to destroy him. He's treated us this way, so now we're going after him. 
But Abigail, Nabal's wife, finds out what's going to occur, and she goes to David, and she entreats David. David, would you please not do this? Would you have mercy? And she brings gifts to David and makes an entreaty of David to say, would you change your mind? David changed his mind and did not attack Nabal. What I want you to see is that one man was unreasonable and the other man was reasonable. I'm going to ask you in your life, are you reasonable or are you unreasonable? There's some people, I don't care what you do, they're just unreasonable. They wake up in the morning on the wrong side of the bed every day. In fact, the best thing they could do is go ahead and shift to the other side of the bed and try that and see if it helps them any. You ever met someone like that? Just ornery, unreasonable, no matter what entreaty you give them, the answer is going to be no. It's going to be resistance. You've got to work through it all the time. You've got to put extra effort in everything you do with them just to try to reason with them. They're just hard-headed. They're just stubborn. They're just hard to deal with. And the Bible says eventually Nabal died, and when he died, his heart turned to stone. Why? Because he was already stoned. So gracious people aren't like that. Gracious people are reasonable. It doesn't mean that you have to say yes to every request, but it does mean that you need to be reasonable in the way you're going about living your life. Gracious people are reasonable. They're easily entreated. Let's go to number six. They're quick to do what? To share. They're quick to share credit and blessings and opportunities and encouragement and praise and gratitude, and just go on and on and on. They're quick to share, quick to pass on blessings. We touched on this a moment ago, but I want to bring it back to this particular point here tonight. Gracious people know how to give credit to other people. They realize, do you know that all of us here tonight, every single one of us, whatever blessings that we've had in our life, whatever blessings you've experienced, is because you're now standing on the shoulders of somebody else. Somebody helps you in the journey, right? And as you've gone through your life journey, there have been people that have been angels of God that have come along from time to time, and maybe they helped you get the job that you got, or maybe they helped you complete a project that you received credit for, or maybe they they did something in your life that was a blessing to you. And, And the problem for many of us is we don't know how to share the credit and share the blessing and share what good things have come to come to us through other people. And then it's also wonderful that when we see an opportunity that someone else could have in their life that we open the doors for other people I've been a blessing I've been blessed in my life by people who've opened doors for me and I want to be someone who can open doors for other people amen okay that's graciousness see graciousness says how can I help that guy how can I help that lady take their life to another not just can how can I get to the next level but how can I help them get to the next level? How can I do something that allows them to have a, an advancement in their life and to allow them to experience more than they've experienced before? Allow them to get in a position where they can be financially blessed or whatever it might be. How can I facilitate that? See, graciousness is all about letting goodness flow through you to people around you, just like God's grace flows to you and brings goodness into your life. All right? We've got two more. Can you handle two more? Gracious people focus on what? (laughs) Principles, not rules. Now, certain rules are rules. We need rules in our society because some people, the only way you get them to do anything is give them a rule. That's the only thing thing it's going to do anything for them. So if you don't give them any rules, you're not going to do anything or obey or follow the the track at all. But the best way to live your life is to live your life not by a whole set of rules, but by a set of principles. Do you know that that's part of what Jesus communicated when he came into the world? In in, In the old covenant, there were a whole bunch of rules, right? Right, right? All the rules, of what you're supposed to do, and eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth, and, and all these rules and regulations. And so nobody ever worried about what was in your heart. You just followed the rule, okay? 
Didn't matter what was in your heart, just do what the rule says, okay? Well, Jesus comes along and said, you've heard it said, but now I say to you, love, in the Old Testament it says, love your, your friends and hate your enemies, but I say love your enemies, that is, let the principle of love guard your life. It's, not no, it's no longer about a rule, it's about li- letting love flow from your life and righteousness be in you so you don't have to have a rule for everything. See, if righteousness is in you, if love is in you, you don't need a rule for everything. Why? Because the principle of love and the principle of righteousness and the principle of goodness and the principle of these these kinds of things live in you and so you don't have to have a rule for I don't have to have a rule that says don't take that person's purse I don't need that rule because I love you I'm not going to steal from you right and so I have I have a a guidance inside of me that is internal all rules are externally motivated things principles are internally and people who are gracious learn how to they're not walking around living by rules only and enforcing rules on everybody. They're living by principle, the principles of God's kingdom, Jesus Christ at work inside of them. They focus on principles. Doesn't mean that rules don't happen, but their focus is on principles. Last thing here. Why don't we read this one together? They believe and work for the best in themselves, others, and in their work and influence. They, what's this? Let's start there just for a moment. How do you view people? How do I view people? Do I believe the best about people? Do I believe that there's potential in people? Do I believe the best? See, gracious people approach people with a belief in the best for them. And then they also do what else? They work for the best in themselves. You start there. How can I be the best person I can possibly be? That takes the emphasis off of somebody else. It puts the emphasis on me. How can I be the best person? How can I bring out the best in others? How can I do the best work that I possibly can do? And how at the end of the day can I leave the best influence I can possibly leave in this world? How can I contribute my very the best. Let's go back to David for a moment as we're wrapping up tonight. When Mephibosheth was invited to the king's palace, as I said a few moments ago, what happened was that David didn't just throw him a little sort of a bone and say, here you go, buddy, I'm, I've been thinking about doing something nice for you. I hope this is nice. We'll see you later. No, what David did is he set up Mephibosheth from a place of failure to a place of success. He found the best he could do for him And in that, he demonstrated the kindness, the favor, the goodness of God to Mephibosheth. And from that time forward, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table, and his life was forever changed because David said, I believe good for you, and I'm going to work for what's best in you. And I want to leave something in you that will create an influence. And by the way, I'll show you how strong that influence is that David did for Mephibosheth. We're still talking about it today. Thousands of years later, we're still talking about the very thing that David did. Why? Because he was a man that knew how to demonstrate grace. Had David experienced grace? You better believe he had. And because David had experienced grace, what did he share with other people? Grace. Can I remind us today that if we're going to have good relationships... One of the best things you and I can do is learn how to be more gracious in our interactions with people. The more gracious you are, the more impact you'll have for the kingdom of God. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had this weekend to to gather around your word. Thank you for the great story of David and Mephibosheth. Lord, it's a tremendous story reminding us of just what you're like because David was demonstrating the same character that you demonstrate to us and Father we pray in the name of Jesus that you'll help us in all of our interactions to become more gracious Lord help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ not only vertically in relationship with you Lord but also horizontally to the people around us let grace flow to us And let grace flow through us, I pray, in Jesus' name.
Hi, Pastor Dale here. Thanks so much for being a part of today's service. I trust that something that was said in the service today or some song that was sung was meaningful to you and you're carrying away with you something that will help you in your days to come. I want to talk just for a moment. So stay with me. Please stay with me for the next few moments because I want to talk about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. There's some that are watching today that you've never felt like you even had a personal relationship with God. You don't even understand perhaps exactly what that means. And I want to share with you today what that means. It means that you have come to the place of turning your life over to Jesus, believing Him to be the Savior of your life, and again, committing your life to Him. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief, the devil, comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. In those two passages that I've just mentioned, there's the promise of eternal life in Jesus and abundant life in Jesus. And so Jesus is the pathway to both of those things. Believing in Jesus is more than just a mental assent that you believe he was some historical figure. It is opening your heart in a personal way and accepting him as your savior, knowing that you have sinned and you need a savior and believing and knowing that Jesus is your way to God. To do that, it involves a prayer. It involves turning your life over to him. The Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it's your moment right now. I believe that God brought you to this moment in a very unique way because this is your day to turn your life over to Jesus. So if you've never prayed a prayer to invite him into your life, would you pray that prayer with me right now? There are many of you that you need to do that right now. And I challenge you, encourage you, take the step today. You will not regret the step to pray this prayer and open your life to Christ. Just bow your head with me right where you are and let's pray together. Start by just whispering the name Jesus or speaking his name. He wants to hear you praying to him. So go ahead and speak, to his, speak his name. Say, Jesus, I know and I admit that I am a sinner. I've sinned against you, God, and I'm sorry. Jesus, I do believe that you're the Savior, the Son of God. I do believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And Jesus, I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, right now, come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. Today, I turn my life over to you. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you so much for the folks today that have prayed that prayer. Thank you that you know every one of them by name. Thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and purpose for each of their lives. And I'm asking, Lord, that you will now encourage them with a sense of peace and joy and recognition that they've made the most important, the most significant decision they will ever make in life. Help them to grow in you and follow you and serve you faithfully from this day forward. For that, we thank you in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer with me, and I believe that many of you did, we are thrilled that you've made the decision to give your heart and life to Jesus. The Bible says that anytime one person turns to Christ, anytime one person turns to a new relationship with God, the, the angels in heaven actually have a party. They rejoice over everyone. So there's a big party going on in heaven right now just because of you. Now we want to help you get started in your relationship with Jesus by giving you a gift because you need to know what to do next. How do I get on this journey? with Jesus every day. How do I now live for him? And that's what this little book is all about. It's called A New You. And the way that you will get this book and you need it is simply by grabbing your phone, going to the text messaging app right now uh, and typing in the word, texting in the word new, N-E-W, and then sending it to 313131. Again, type in the word new and send this to 313131 and we'll get this book in your hand. We're not here to bug you, bother you. We want to help you get started in your relationship with Jesus. So again, new to 313131 or right where you're watching online. Uh, if you'll look at the web app there, wherever you might be, uh, the chat host is providing a link. It says, I prayed to receive Jesus or something to that effect. It says, I raised my hand or I, I'm just, I can click here to receive the gift. And this is, you can get, get the gift that way as well, either by texting or by clicking on your link that the chat host is providing. Again, we thank you for being a part of this weekend service. We're so blessed that you've been here. And I, I love to send everyone out in a new week with a blessing from God. I do believe in the power of blessing. You know, so many times in life we hear so many curses coming our way, but God wants to extend blessing to you. And so can I speak a blessing? 
blessing over your life. Would you just open your palms, open your hand today and look up to God as I speak this blessing over you and receive it as a gift from Him to go forward in your week. Now may God Almighty strengthen you with the strength and power of His Word and His Spirit. May you be filled this week with wisdom. May you walk wisely with God. May you know the steps to take this week, knowing that God is leading you in your journey. He is your shepherd. He's guiding you along the way. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And He is for you. Have a blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church family, we just want to take a minute and say thank you so much for your faithfulness, your consistency, and your giving. You all are such a blessing. You're such a generous church, and we're so grateful for you. It's so exciting to be able to impact the world around us and the nations around us, and we thank you for being a part of that, being partners with us. So we encourage you to remain faithful in your giving. We also want to encourage you to check out our reoccurring giving. You may want to sign up for that. You can go to our website, church-redeemer.org slash give, and you can find out information of how to sign up for reoccurring giving. Makes it a little easier. You don't even have to think about it. So you might wanna check that out. Otherwise, we just wanna take a minute and say thank you so much. We love you. There are a few different ways you can give here at Redeemer. You can text your amount to 74483. You can go online to church-redeemer.org slash give. You can use the MyCOR app, or you can mail in your gift to 19425 Woodfield Road, Gaithersburg, Maryland, 20879. Happy Mother's Day to all of the moms and to everyone. Thank you for joining us for service. I'm Alex, and I'm here to bring you this week's Redeemer News. First things first, if you prayed with the pastor to receive Jesus into your life, that is amazing. You just made the best decision of your life, and we want to resource you with a gift. It's this book called A New You, and will help guide you in your new life with Christ. To get this book, you can either text NEW to 313131, click the button on the screen, or the link provided by the chat host. Also, if you just gave your life to Jesus or are simply looking to meet new people at Redeemer, we're going to be having a meet and greet right after service. To join, follow the instructions placed in the chat. Being a mother, father, husband, or wife is such a beautiful opportunity, but it comes with its own unique challenges and difficulties. Nobody expects you to lead your family and raise your children alone. This is why we have marriage and parenting groups at Redeemer where you can connect with people in a similar season to be encouraged and uplifted as well as challenged to become the best version of yourself. To join marriage, parenting, or any other groups, visit church-redeemer.com slash groups. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Proverbs 22, 6. We want to come alongside you in this process of raising your children by offering our Our Kids and Youth programs. Our Kids happens during every service at our Gaithersburg campus, and our youth experience every Saturday night at our 6 p.m. service at Gaithersburg. Our Kids is currently in a series called Grow, talking all about the fruit of the Spirit. And youth is in a series called On the Other Side, talking about entering back into life post-COVID. Both Our Kids and youth create weekly content on YouTube. For all information on our kids and youth, visit church-redeemer.org slash info or go to the MyCR app. Thank you so much for joining us for service this weekend. Be sure to check out our social media and church app for more convenient ways to connect. And to stay in the loop with Redeemer events, be sure to visit church-redeemer.org slash info. This has been your Redeemer News. We love you and can't wait to see you next week.